Thank you for joining the Judaism Demystified podcast. We are honored to have Frank Mink, who is a ex-skinhead, and his story is unbelievable. So before we get into it, I just want to, I wanted to thank you. Um, you've personally inspired me a lot. I've watched your story um, on a few channels and I'm like, I got to have this guy on. So if you can just tell the audience um, just how everything started with you, um, your whole beginning of your journey. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me on and thank you for asking me. Um, I'm honored. I'm always honored to, to get a chance to, to talk and uh, share my story and share what I'm up to today. So um, because I obviously have a purpose and I'm doing things for a purpose. So uh, to start off with my story is um, I wasn't raised Jewish at all. In fact, didn't even know I was Jewish. Um, was raised in an Irish Catholic neighborhood, um, was raised believing I was just Irish and Italian, um, which was uh, for South Philly. That's a, kind of the perfect mix uh, in where I grew up. Um, my mom and my, my my mom rebelled from her Irish Catholic family and later went and got with an Italian guy uh, who was like a Rocky Balboa. This is the 70s. So, you know, Rocky Balboa. My dad was kind of like a Rocky Balboa superstar guy of the neighborhood tough fighter all that good stuff you know sell drugs and my mom liked the bad boy and that's how i came to be um those two didn't last very long not at all in fact uh you know i probably my mom probably moved out from him his house and where they his neighborhood probably when i was about two-ish maybe three and uh we moved in with my grandparents back in the irish catholic neighborhood and uh Anyway, my mom, me and my mom wound up moving in on our own, and my mom struggled at times. I remember being on food stamps as a child. I remember having food stamps, like literally being on welfare and having food stamps and being know, knowing that that was like for the poor people, like as a kid. I mean, that's my thought, you know, it was the, for the poor people. And, um, I was embarrassed. Uh, you know, I wasn't ashamed of my mom, but I was just kind of embarrassed of our situation sometimes. And I knew that she was doing the best she could. Like even back then, I knew she was doing the best she could. And uh, so we struggled. And so my mom wound up getting remarried to a man who was not a good man to me. You know, he he did not like that I was Italian. He didn't like anything about me. I mean, he moved in my mom's house. He's now taking over the house. And here's this little scrappy young guy. I was maybe nine going on 10 when he moved in my home. And um, just not not a nice man to me. And uh, I basically lived in a house with a bully who liked to bully me around and, and uh, punish me and beat me and just not wasn't good. That's all I could say. I don't want to, you know, can't really give his side of the story. But uh, I was a child and I hated going home every day. I hated going home so badly that I wish sometimes when I would get hit by a car like that when I would come home from school. I only had two blocks from my school to my house, you know, it's in South Philly, a little, you know, little neighborhoods and stuff, but my school was only two blocks away, man. And I wish some days it was two miles away. Cause so I just hate having to walk straight home to school I mean, from a school right home. And I would try to get hit by cars. Cause I was like, if I, I didn't want to die, you know, I was a kid. I didn't want to die. I just wanted to get hit by a car so I can go to a hospital for the day instead of going home. Like I thought that would be nicer and I'd be kinder. Um, and everyone in South Philly gets hit by cars. Like, it's just the thing to do. You live in the little small, narrow streets. Everyone's zooming around. Everyone's related. So you're always getting run over by a family member or a cousin. Can't sue anybody. You know what I mean? You just get hit by a car and you shut your mouth. And here I'm the one kid that wants to get hit by a car. And uh, it just doesn't happen. And uh, anyway, um, eventually I uh, got in trouble at school. I was 13. And I walked home from school. And my stepdad was waiting for me and uh, beat the living crap out of me. And uh, while he was beating the crap out of me, he told me to pack my stuff. I was going to move with my dad. And uh, my dad lived in a rough neighborhood, even way more rougher neighborhood than my mom's. But you know, it was rough. And uh, I just remember I was happy. Like, I was happy I was at least not going to have to go home to him anymore. I knew I was going to go to a rougher neighborhood, and I knew things were not going to be easy. But I was like, as long as I ain't got to see that man anymore, I'm cool. And so... Uh, but I was sad, you know what I mean? My mom gave me up, man. She gave me up for this guy. Like she wanted this relationship with him that worked so bad, she was willing to, to throw me away. And and that's what I knew. Was he also, so anyway, that was he also abusing the mom or just you? No, no, no. My mom's a tough cookie, man. My mom's my mom was a drinker and a brawler. You yeah, she 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 would hit him sometimes. Not about me, just about 
you know, whatever. My, my mom, he didn't abuse my mom. My mom, my mom was a tough little cookie. So he, uh, mind his P's and Q's with her, um, in, in a way. I mean, they were both into drinking and drugs really bad, but I, I never seen him hit my mom ever. And I, I actually see my mom hit him a few times when she was lit up pretty good. So, you know, so yeah, uh, she, he, he just liked taking it out on me mm -hmm. and, uh, it's just the way it was. So anyway, that's uh, that year in the middle of the school year, I had to go move to my dad's neighborhood. My dad lives up in Southwest West Philly. Some of you guys, if you ever seen the show Fresh Prince of Bel Air, where yeah. Will Smith sings about West Philly, born and raised on the playground where I spent most of my days. Um, that's my dad's neighborhood. So my white butt moved into that neighborhood that he moved out of, <laughs> and so I had to go to an all black school. My dad had a little bar, like a little tavern that he basically lived at all the time. I never seen the guy. And I just went to the school in this black neighborhood in the black school. And and uh, as a new white kid in the middle of the school year, a little, um, I was kind of a little skateboarder, punk rocker athlete. Um, I'm a, you know, a born and bred athlete. And I always played sports. Even I was like a little punk rock kid, always exceed it in sports, uh, always set records, whatever, you know, not talking ego stuff, just the truth. I was a really, really good athlete. It's in my it's in my dad's family's blood. They're all star athletes, and it was in me too. So anyway, I get to this new school, man, where I'm you know, start fist fighting with black kids all the time. My other school I went to before this, my mom's neighborhood, like it was a very diverse school, and we all kind of got along for the most part because it was black, it was white, it was it's Irish, it was Italian, it was Cambodian, it was Puerto Rican. Now I moved and it's 20 white kids, not 20%. There was just 20 of us <laughs> that went to that school and it was tough. And uh, I would come home from school and I could have a black eye or I can have a trophy in my hand. And my parents, neither my parents or my step parents were going to say, huh, how'd you get that, son? It's just, wow. it wasn't, wasn't parenting, parenting style. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, uh, I start cutting school. I'll tell you a real quick, funny story about that is um, I started cutting school every day and it was Philadelphia. So I would take the train down in the center city, Philly. And when I would go down to Center City, I would always like sneak in the museums and, you know, there's a lot of historical stuff. You know, I mean, we have the most famous crack in all the world, crack in the Liberty Bell. So everyone comes from all over the world to see our crack. But anyway, I loved the city of Philly and I love the historical part of it. And I used to go sneak into Ben Franklin's house every day. Like I used to go down there almost every day. And I would, he was one of the main exhibits I would always sneak in. And because all the school kids that were there for school class trips, they would be coming out of there and. Uh, they come out the back door, you know, a big long line of them because they were went through there as a class trip. And I wait and soon the door open, I pop in, I run in there and go hang out all day and do all the exhibits and learn everything about Ben Franklin. Fast forward before I'm going to tell you when I get into this group, but the next year um, I went back to school for a very brief moment. And the funny thing was I went back to school for a very brief moment then following year. And when I was there, the school goes, hey, we're going to Ben Franklin's house for a class trip. And I'm telling everyone in my class, I'm like, oh, man, I sneak in that place. I'll tell you all about it. I'll show you all the exhibits. I'll show you how this works, that works. I'm, you know, bragging. I'm a kid, you know. This did this for a year, you know, a couple of months. I snuck in this guy's house. So anyhow, they, um, we, um, what happened was we go down to the, for the class trip. And as we go into the class trip, um, pull up in the front door now again i'm bragging everybody hey i sneak in here i sneak in here well soon you pull up in the front door i've never been through the front door there's a big sign we get off the school bus there's a big sign that says free emissions <laughs> <laughs> so and i'll tell you this and i just tell you that story just to tell you what's wrong with my brain because when i was stealing the knowledge i could tell you everything about ben franklin as soon as i found out it was free i was like that's stupid you know what i mean like just crazy you know so that's that's that was my life in an eggshell right there well let's go back now so what happens is um that summer i got to get out of the city my uncle who moved up to the lancaster pennsylvania area not lancaster pennsylvania but the lancaster pennsylvania area and if any of you guys have ever been through that area or know that area it's all amish people so my aunt and uncle they moved from the them from South Philly, they were not Amish, they were Philians, and they moved up in that area and they brought their kids with them. And my cousins hated it when they first moved up there. They hated living up there. I mean, they went from living right around the corner from all of their cousins, and literally, we all lived right around the corner from each other, to now being up in farmlands with Amish people. So, my uncle used to come get us 
younger cousins to come hang out with those cousin ups there to try to, you know, ease it out a little bit. You know what I mean? At least bring some of the home up to them. And so my uncle used to always come get me because I didn't have my, you know, always being passed and forth between my mom and dad. I really was kind of lost. And my uncle would always say, and me and my cousins that lived up there were very, very good friends. I mean, I loved hanging out with my cousins up there. So, and it was, for me, it was a great, I loved it. They hated it. I loved it. I mean, seeing, you know, Amish people in horse and buggies and seeing cows and pigs and chickens. And I don't know if you know, like Amish people like really turn butter for like, they don't do it because they're reacting, reacting it, you know, reenacting it. They really just turn butter. And that stuff to me was like fascinating. So I loved it up there. And anyway, I go up there for the summer this summer. I spent the summer before up there. So I, that's when I became a skateboarder punk rock kid with that same cousin. We got real into punk rock, real into skateboarding. So I go up that summer, this summer now, and um, he, I walk into his room and he's got like a swastika flag. He's got like a Confederate flag. He's got stuff about like neo-Nazis on his wall, like newspaper articles. And then my cousin comes home. And when he comes home, they, um, as they come home, he was shaved bald. And the year before, man, he was you know, mohawked out and punk rocked out. Now he's like shaved bald, he has nicely cropped pants on, nice jacket on, and you know, just looks different, looks cleaner, looks neater. And um we start talking about, you know, I start talking about what he's into and he starts telling me about how he's into this new thing, these neo Nazi groups and how he's, you know, they're for the white race. And I'm like, all right, whatever. And how how old were you at the time? 13. I'm 13 going on 14 years old right, this summer. This is like, yeah, what? I moved, probably went up there right in the beginning of May and I was turning, about to turn 14. So, um, and why, I go up there. And, just now, ask, um, uh, why do they shave their heads? Um, it's an old English thing. It's from England. It was an old working class English thing. Uh, skinheads ain't racist. They didn't start out neo Nazis. They started out in England in the you know in the late sixties, early seventies, mid sixties, you know into the seventies, and they were English working style, you know, working class kids, and that was just the kind of the thing to do. They were like all English working, uh, working clothing, and Doc Martens were like the English working boots. So it was all about like the working class style. Mm -hmm. And cool. some of you know, and some of the if you look at some of the old historical stuff, some of the old skinheads said because they're always fighting, even in England, even though they weren't like again, they weren't like a racist group to start with. They were like kind of political in a way, and they were you know, but they weren't. There was black skinheads and white skinheads back then, and Jim, they were very into like the Jamaican music, and so it was a little different. But a lot of them like to shave their head because you couldn't pull their pull their hair in a fight because a lot of it's about fighting. Oh, so, man. yeah, so you can't, and it takes one less weapon away from the people you're fighting with. So wow. that was, you know, one of the rumors and I, I kind of agree with it. So, so all these other neo-Nazis used to come over my cousin's house at night and when they would come over, you know, they, they were older guys. They were, you know, 16, 17 year olds. They had cars. They sometimes would bring one or two girls over with them. They always brought beer. And to me, man, they were just totally cool um they just were and they had swastika tattoos and whatever and I, you know, I don't know i think it's cool but when these guys start sitting around they start talking about multiracial society don't work now they're talking amongst themselves you know they're 16 and 17 year olds and they start talking about like black people i can tell like these people ain't been around black people before you know what i mean like they live in they live in the, the farms they live around amish people not black people so when they would start talking about like multiracial society don't work, I don't know what that means. But once they start talking about blacks and whites not getting along, I start kind of my even my cousin would say, yo, you just understand like my cousin over here like really lives in a, one of those neighborhoods you all talk about. So I would they would always ask me, like, what's it like? What's it like being around there? What's it like being around black people? What's it like? Is it really this rough? Is it really? And for me, that was someone asking me, how's my day? You know what I mean? Like someone was asking me, how's my life? Because my parents didn't ask me. My parents never asked me, how did you get that black guy? How did you get the show? They just didn't. I didn't. They didn't have time for me. And that's just the truth. And now here's these guys who sit around and drink and be like, so what's it really like? And to me, that was someone going, yo, how's your day? How's your life, Frank? Are you okay? And I got to tell these guys like, no, like I'm, it's hard where I live. It's really hard. 
Um, so the crazy thing was when I would go and, um, I would start going and hanging out with them and they would go to nightclubs and they would go to like concerts and punk rock shows. And I would go with them and I still had my little skater haircut, but they all were shaved bald and they were all together and other neo-Nazis would show up and they were shaved bald and, uh, and they would all get together and they were cool. And I, what I noticed was when they would stand outside at nightclubs, everyone was afraid of them. You know what I mean? Everyone was scared of them. Are and, they uh, teenagers? A lot of them are teenagers or? Yeah, they're all teenagers. They're all teenagers. They're all all teen, all 16, 17, maybe 18 at the most year old kids. So, um, sorry, let me come on the site. So, what happened was when I noticed that people were scared of them, I loved that. Mm -hmm. You know, up until that point in my life, I can look back on it now. I didn't know it then, but I look back on it now, like, Yo, I was a scared little boy. And at 14, I was still a 14 year old kid, but I was probably, I probably stopped mentally growing from when my stepdad moved in. So probably eight or nine. And I feared everything. I feared my parents. I feared my step parents. I feared my school. I feared if I was going to have enough food to eat some days. Now people fear me. All right. I like this. Yeah. So let's, so they asked me to shave my head and uh, later on that night and, I remember they shaved my head and, you know, there was something else that I had happened in my neighborhood that I heard a lot. I would hear people always say things like uh, my uncles and cousins and different people in the neighborhood. They'd always say, if you picked up a penny, what are you, a Jew? <laughs> Everyone laughed, picked up a penny. Or if Johnny didn't bring you back the right change, if Johnny didn't bring you, give you the right change at the story, we, the first thing you get to say is, well, you know, it's because Johnny always trying to Jew somebody. And everybody laughed. It was just, and look, my neighborhood had ethnic jokes for everybody, right? I mean, you joked about the blacks, you joked about the Latinos, you joked about the Italians, and those all groups did the same thing about us, right? I mean, it was just the nature of the beast of living in a, a you know, metro area like that. Mm -hmm. But I remember not, I remember not getting why they would say these racist jokes and why that was so funny, right? I, I would ask my uncle, like, why is that funny? Like when you would say Johnny Juju today. And he goes to tell me one day when I was probably about 10 years old. This was years before this was happening. I said, why is that so funny when you say Johnny tried to Jew you? And he goes, well, see, Frank, the Jews, they're notorious for money. And you know what? You'll get the joke when you're older. It's a funny joke. You'll get it when you're older. Well, I can tell you that um, when I went to my first neo-Nazi rally, my first little get together or first little group where we, I was going to go sit with these guys next. I shaved my head. I'm not part of this group. I'm sitting in this as a Bible studies. They taught how to hate through the Bible and it's this Bible studies. And there's this man, a, a guy who's in his you know manhood to me, he's probably in his mid twenties. He's preaching to all of us. And he starts talking about that. Um, he goes, you know, the Jews secretly funnel money from the federal reserve and they, you know, distribute it throughout all the Jews in the world and in Israel. And what happened to me while he was saying this stuff, for one, I'm 14 years old. I don't know what the federal, I'm 48. I don't, still don't know what the federal reserve does. You know what I mean? It's always bad stuff, you know, but now he's like the federal reserve is controlled by the Jews and what we called back then Zog. That was the name of the, the, when they talk about the deep state, you hear people talk about deep state today. Well, we actually had a name for it. It wasn't just, it was called Zog. Zionist occupational government, and it's the secret Jewish government that runs the world and runs America, and runs everything. And so they would say Zog is secretly taking money out of the Federal Reserve, and da 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 da. And as he's explaining it, all I remember as I sat in that meeting was, I get my uncle's joke. I get the joke. I must be older. I must be older now. I got the joke. And my uncle said, when I'm older. I will get it. I must be older. And I want to be older. I want to be adult. The adults in my life left me to fend for myself. So I want to know what they know. So I was in, man. Like I, I was like, wow, I'm unlearn I'm learning the secrets of the world. These guys are real. And that thing, and that movement became my life from that point on. Can you can you explain just one thing you mentioned was that they would teach hate through the Bible. Oh, yeah. 
So I'm assuming this means like the verses in the New Testament that are like anti-Jewish or seemingly anti-Jewish. Oh, no, 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 no. It was, it was the Torah. You're gonna, oh, the Torah. Oh, yes. Yeah. You, want, you, you ready? You want to hear a good story? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you're going <laughs> to you're going to love it. Um, and, and then I'm, I'm going to tell you the story and then I'm going to show you how factually this is what they really believe. You know, you're, you're going to you're, it's going to blow your mind. Because it's stuff that you've probably heard before. So they say that when Adam and Eve, when Hava was uh, going to, when the serpent man comes to, to Eve to to partake of this fruit of knowledge and this, this tree, that that's not what really happened. They say, come on now, you got to read between the lines. Why wouldn't they be able to take from one tree? The thing is that they never had sex before. So what happens is the serpent man comes to her and he gets to have some action with her and he impregnates her with Cain. So what she does is once she does this one deed, now she has this, this knowledge of this, this deed. Okay. So now she goes back and she knows that she's pregnant. So she runs back to Adam. That's why she tricks him and says, Hey, you have to do this with me. And it's not eating a piece of fruit. It's not partaking of a fruit. It's partaking of her. Mm. And that now she's going to lie to him and say that Cain, this first baby in her, is his. So now we got the first Maury Povich episode going on, okay? <laughs> right? But <laughs> let me just get, it even gets even more weirder. So now that Satan, or the demons, and this demon snake person in the story, he, since he impregnates her with Cain, Cain later on kills Abel, Cain is banished, and Cain is the first real evil Jew on the planet. Wow. So you'll hear this now, just so you know, when next time you ever look up or research any of these groups, these Christian identity, these hardcore Christian conservative groups, and they and you look up where they say things like, the Jews are the seed of Satan. I don't know if you've ever heard, it's a That's saying, funny. the Jews are the well, seed of Satan. It goes back to that story. It's from that story. Yeah. Or so, you, hear, you hear like lizard, lizard, or or uh, or uh, what is it called, serpent? You hear these kind yeah. of yeah, they 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 say these kind of things. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Reptilian, you know, shape mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's that's. I mean, and when and when I would hear that stuff, now I was born and raised. Again, I wasn't. Uh, you know, I didn't know I was Jewish until later, much much later on. So what's funny is I was born and raised Irish Catholic, and I had um. You know, was just born and raised Catholic, so I uh, went to catechism. I went and I learned, uh, you know, that Bible, and I never heard Father Wassel or Sister Mary Agnes, the nuns. They never taught me that story that these guys were teaching me. You know, because, and so it was always again, it was always like unlocking something. Something's new. Something's deeper. Something's this way. So, one second, turn on the light here. Sorry, guys, I'm gonna turn on the light. That's okay. Time. Yeah, yeah, that should work better. Okay. Sorry. It might edit that out. So I'm gonna try and leave these lights on. Um so any so anyhow, um, you know, so that was just some of the stories. I mean, uh, every and then you know, all people other than the Jews who are from the Satan, uh, all everyone else is beast of the fields. If you can't get blood in the face, that's this this theory, even though that we know and I know now that. Jewish people blush. Everyone, a lot of people blush. Even white skinned black people blush. Um, even black people can blush. But there's even a, a theory and a saying called blood in the face. If they can't get blood in the face, usually meaning European, then you're not white and you're not, it means you don't have a conscience and that only God gave the people that blush a conscience. Wow. Mm -hmm. Crazy. Yeah. And now we need to pick up arms because in the in their New Testament and the, you know uh, at, at one just one part just one part uh, J C says or Jesus says um, Jesus says sell your cloak and buy a sword and to them that means arm yourself to the gills with guns because of that one little part in the book. Like they take that and they run with it. Like that's why they stockpile weapons. Because one time, this person in the book said, "Sell your sell your cloak and buy a sword." And to them, that means ARs, 
Mac tens, whatever. So just just so you know what you're dealing with here. But did and you that's who I'm like, running. Do you feel any like connection to like the the Christianity or you weren't like a spiritual person at that point? You're just being told you're just being taught this stuff and you're not really like connecting to anything, are you? Yeah, no. I mean, there was no there was no peace, there was no connection, there was no, you know, there was nothing working on a relationship with 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 Hashem. There's no working of relation. No, it's I want to bleed this stuff so I can ram it down your throat and tell you that you're wrong and that I'm right. That's it. That's all I learned it for. I learned it so I had ammunition in an argument. Mm-hmm. You know? So um so yeah, I mean, and a, a lot of the groups that run in these neo-Nazi worlds are are religious like that. Um, so now, guys, I just, I mean, I fully get involved. I go back to the city of Philadelphia because I can't live up in the farms the whole summer. Obviously, I mean, for the summer I did. Now I go back down, and, and then I just started recruiting people. It was very, very easy in my in my dad's neighborhood and in my mom's neighborhood. Because my dad's neighborhood had a little alcove of white people, and in my mom's neighborhood, obviously, it was Irish, and there was Italian kids up on the other end. And you know, it was very easy because it was what you do, man. It, it's now I don't know that I'm pulling the greatest bait and switch of all time on people. I don't know that. I think I'm really doing what I'm supposed to be doing, and that is defending the white race. Because look at what the blacks are doing. But the truth is, um, the greatest bait and switch ever pulled is this. Someone says, man, I want to be proud of my heritage. How come whenever I say I'm going to be proud to be white, then everyone screams I'm a racist. But black people can say, and this is real arguments, guys. I'm, I'm using word for word arguments that people said. So they would say, but if I say I'm proud to be white, that I'm a racist. But if they say they're proud to be black, oh, that's okay. And I say, yeah, yeah, that's right. And they say, yeah, I have, uh, they have BET, but we don't have, you know, white entertainment television, not knowing at the time that all televisions, white, enter- you know, there wasn't many black people on friends, you know, I mean, <laughs> you know, so let's be real. Well, when I would hear guys like that say that, I would always say, like, okay, well, so, um, I want to believe that stuff too, man. Like I, I believe in our heritage. So if you want to say you're proud to be white, man, come join my group. Cause that's what we're all about. Well, when we would go and you would come to our meetings, we never talked about being proud of our heritage. We always talked about their heritage and how come they're messing everything up and they're always treading and they're bad like you never talked about our heritage in a good way we only talked about other people so the greatest bait and switches these people want to have pride in this race but when they come join our group it's all about hate it's all about look at what they're doing they're destroying everything so it's this huge bait and switch man and uh and i participated in that for years and again guys just so you know because you probably think like i i didn't think i was evil i didn't think i was bad i thought i was really trying to defend the white race of america and that you know the other no one else in the world understood what we understood you know like you're really i mean you know it's a brainwashing in a way it's a and, and it's you know it's very very prevalent today it's it's huge today in this country you know it's just changed forms a little bit yeah um but it's still there it's the same thing um so anyway guys as i was in the movement i just you know was very violent very violent kid man and i mean 15 16 17 i'm 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 making a name for myself in this movement. I'm recruiting. I'm making big crews everywhere. I'm 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 harming people. I'm like torturing Antifa. As you guys have probably all heard of the group Antifa, and you know the anti-fascist movement. Well, that's our biggest enemy. That's our that's our enemy. That's our sworn enemy. And so we'd fight with them and plot and scheme against them, and they plot and scheme against us. And uh, I, mean, I used to kidnap them and hold them for ransom and. Um, it was an ongoing war. And so, and I know with other groups and, and obviously spray painting a synagogue was nothing. That was a, a Friday night. You know, those weren't sought out things. We just did them. It was horrible. And, um, and that's just what we did guys. I mean, that's just the truth. I gotta be honest. So you, people can get the truth about what these groups are like. You were, um, you were meeting at this point, like the higher ups because you were moving up the ranks kind of. Um, did you get yeah. important people in the movement? 
yeah, no, I was, I was considered, and I don't mean this to sound egotistical because it's not about my ego today, but yeah, I mean, I was started running TV shows. Now it's, so, <laughs> hopefully you take this the right way. But what was funny is I, um, even in the movement, I was the guy who worked in television. Again, I don't know I'm Jewish, but I'm acting pretty Jewish. Like I'm working in TV in our movement, right? Yeah. So like I have this whole thing going on and, uh, like I'm like the promoter. I'm like I, I'm just the recruiter. I'm I'm working in television. I'm the one getting the shows out there. Re, you know, so very active in that. Very active in that. And so uh, I'm working with some of the high ups all around the country. David Duke, who you know, David Duke was one of the guys we worked with. Uh, Tom Metzger. You know, just you name that. We were we were doing things with those types of people. And uh, um, you know, one of the things that you know, and this is what's you know, kind of scary is, and the truth is, is that a lot of us in that movement were told like, because I happened to get a big swastika on my neck early on when I was about 15, I got a big swastika tattooed on my neck. And a lot of the older guys and the, the David Dukish, and not David Duke didn't say this to me personally, but his type of people were saying to me like, dude, don't get those type of tattoos. We need you guys to get in the military. We need you guys to become cops, like come home, become cops. Be, be, you know, that's where we're going to do the real damage to these other communities you know the black community the latino community this is where we'll do the most damage so don't be getting these type of tattoos keep them covered up keep your you know keep your beliefs low and uh, of course i was so far on the other end where i was like no we're foot soldiers in a race war no way so anyhow guys i wound up like kidnapping a guy in, in out in springfield illinois an antifa guy and uh let him go and he eventually told the cops about the torturing and the, the beating and the, the kidnapping. And so um, I went to prison I was in prison in, in uh, so I was 17 years old. They charged me as an adult and um, I wound up going to big boy prison. While I was, I was in the same prison with John Wayne Gacy. I don't know if you guys ever study serial killers or yeah. I mean, I was in the same prison with that guy. <laughs> That's how crazy my life was at seven, 17 years old. They charged me as an adult. And I deserved it. I'm not one of these people that's about abolishing prisons or anything. I, I deserve to be there. And there's other men that deserve to be there. I don't think our prison system is run right. And I think there's too many people in there that don't need to be there. But anyway, that's a whole other topic we can get into. But the truth is, I went in there and I deserved to be in there. Um, while I was in there, because I was one of the youngest kids in the prison, before I got sent up to prison, I had to do time in the county jail waiting my trial. You know, that's how it works. And while I was in there, I made some friends with some black kids just because I had to wait like five months to get my trial, you know, up. And I wound up taking a plea bargain. But uh, about five months up in the county jail, there was a couple of black kids I was kind of cool with, played cards with, uh, watched TV with, um, played <laughs> basketball with because we had a little bit. They see they, they would see your swastika and that wouldn't like uh kind of cause an issue over there or not really. Uh, yeah, you're in prison. They're, a lot of them are part of Nation of Islam. A lot of them were part of black gangs that you know done bad things to white people. You know what I mean? So it's we're just kids and they're trying to do time. You know what I mean? They they and and if they they've done any other prison time before this, you go upstate prison, man. There's tons of Aryan gangs and white racist gangs to them. I saw I was just one of those, I was just one of those gang members, you know what I mean? To them. And I, you know, so, and when you're in the County jail, man, you got to keep it cool. Cause you're, you're coming up on trial. You know what I mean? So you keep, you know, you might get a lot of the times, man, you know, you always hear a lot of people say, well, where'd you find God at? Well, I found him in the County jail. It's like, yeah, when you have a public defender, you need God. So, you know, everyone's being real cool in the county jail with each other. And so we, you know, they were, they were young kids. I was young kids. We, we played cards together. They didn't care that it's lost on my neck. I mean, there's, you know, at least I was open about my racism. You know, it's the other people that aren't open about the racism they're worried about. So, so now, um, so yeah, now, um, I'm up in the state prison and, um, I get sent up state and some of those kids from the county jail, black kids they wound up getting sent up state too and i wound up running back into them but while i was up in the state prison i'm running with my aryan gangs i'm doing all the things i'm supposed to be doing um you know i do all my gang stuff and uh but when i play basketball and football with some of the aryan gangs you know these are bikers from southern central illinois like they don't know how to dribble a basketball they don't i'm not knocking them they can fix your transmission at two years old they're bikers 
you know, they're Harley riders and they can fix your bike and your motorcycle and your car at a young age. They don't practice dribbling a basketball. They don't practice, uh, you know, cradling a football the right way. So I did. And so when I started playing with those guys, they, they were horrible at sports. Just, they just were. And basketball was a joke. I mean, they would just pick up the ball and run. They didn't dribble. And I just got tired of it, you know. And so I've seen some of the black kids I came up in the county jail with who I played basketball with in the county jail. So they knew I was good. They knew I could dish the rock off to anybody. I was a great passer. I'm a little – one of those little great little white, uh, you know, point guards who can, you know, throw, pass the ball between your legs to another person. I mean, I was just one of those guys. And uh, so one day the black kids asked me to play. Actually, one of the first sports they had me play was football. Cause I, I was, and I was always very, very, very well – trained and good football player as a kid growing up so get a couple first and them kicks off kickoff returns man and you're the only white kid on this on the team and a lot of on both teams and the other teams all black kids are going to rip your head off or black guys are going to rip your head off when they catch you and i'm doing a kickoff return you ain't catching me <laughs> like i'm that fast you know what i mean i'm gone i'm gonna hit that hole i'm like one if you ever watch the nfl i'm like one of them little white football kickoff return guys man i just get that ball and i'm just gone and so a lot of the black kids seen I was good. So then they made me a wide receiver. And then my nickname changed in the prison. They used to call me Aryan boy, skinhead boy, Philly boy, because I had a really hard Philly accent. I was in the Chicago prison system. And then this all started calling me Steve for this guy named Steve Largent. I don't know if you ever remember. He was a little white wide receiver for the Seattle Seahawks. And they all call me Steve all the time. And that was just like my name. It just stuck. Like everyone called me Steve. And I was like, whatever, I'm not going to correct them. So I really didn't give a crap what you call me, you know, as long as we're not starting trouble. So, guys, I'm in prison. I'm getting along with, uh, again, people are like, well, didn't your Aryans care? No, I was one of the most educated racists they'd ever met. And I'm not joking. And I'll give you a quick story. In prison, there are men that dress like women. That's just the way they live their life. So be it. That's the way life is for them. I, I'm not judging. But in there, that we call them the queens. Well, one day, this one queen was trying to talk to me uh, for whatever reason. This black queen was trying to talk to me about something and I blew her off. It's like, whatever. And it's a man dressed like a woman, just to give you the details of the story. And so uh, she walked on. Well, later on that night, she seen me again, but I was standing with all the Aryans who were trying to introduce themselves to me again. I'm at the neo-Nazi who had a TV show and kidnapped an Antifa man. I'm, I'm royalty. I'm like consider royalty in there. And the guys love taking care of me. They knew that I knew all the literature. I knew every, you know, I knew way more than any of the bikers who just got in the prison because they were, and, you know, and they got in there and realized they're outnumbered and they better join a gang. I'm a guy that was on the outside with a swastika on my neck. So they all liked me. So when this one queen comes walking by me in front of all these other Aryans and she's like being rude. She's like, Hey, what's up? And she's like waving to me. What's up? I was looking at her, you know, and I, and I, she embarrassed me. It was embarrassing. I mean, it just was, it was an embarrassing moment in my life. I'm standing in front of these Aryans. She's like, Hey, what's going on? <laughs> and so, you know what I mean? So it was just an embarrassing moment. So one of the Aryans at the time trying to show off to me, he goes, Yo, Frank, how about that? When that when the master race takes over, he's getting shot twice. He's black and he's gay. And everyone's like, yeah, that's what's up. That's what's up. And I was like, I turned around. I was like, no, nah, man. I was like, no, guys. If he's black and he's gay, he's not going to be with a woman. He's not going to reproduce his race. That's what we need. And they were all like, yo, that's crazy. That's deep, man. Oh, my God. Wow. Well, that's some deep stuff, right? There. Like I was the most intelligent racist they'd ever met. <laughs> so when I went and played football with black kids, they weren't like, oh, this guy's changing. And I didn't feel like I was changing. I just wanted the competition. I really just, I was a 17-year-old kid who wanted to run, who was a very well-trained and, and athletic kid. So I just wanted to run. And, uh, and, and I did like showing off to the black kids, you know what I mean? I, I was good enough that I could talk trash, get up, take hits, all that good stuff. So anyhow, um, I, uh, getting released from prison guys and I'm kind of cool with everybody. I just am. I mean, and I'm not, three year, not being three year stint. Well, how long was it? I did a, I did a year upstate. It was a year. So I get upstate. I do a year and I'm getting out and my anniversary actually 30 years ago, a week ago, I, I got out of jail. 30 years and one week ago is mm -hmm. when I got out. So that's how long ago this story all happened, right? Well, what happens is um, 
I'm getting released from prison. And uh, again, I, I'm still a neo-Nazi. Uh, this isn't American History X where like I change or there was a change in there. Like I didn't change yet. So I get out from prison and um, I go back to Philly. And when I, I go from Illinois back to Philly, my crew back home is gigantic. I started that crew. I mean, literally the crew that is going, I started. And um, and now it's gigantic. And so when people are coming to hang out with me, these are like new guys. And I'm like, oh, and I'm, I, I, I please hope that I, I'm, I know I'm, it sounds egotistical, but I'm just trying to be for real with people. I was like a legend. I just got home from prison for kidnapping an Antifa member, our arch rival. And now I'm coming home and, uh, and you know, I did big boy prison time. So I come home and my ego is big. I have a big ego. That's all I live off is my ego at the time, of course. And I don't know if you ever guys ever heard the saying, but you know what ego means, right? Ego, ego stands for easing God out. So I had no God. I just had all my ego. And now I'm home. I'm trying to get this thing going. I get back with my neo-Nazi crew and I'm hearing these new guys come around and they're saying things like all black people are like this, all black people, are, all Latino. And I just had enough experience in prison where I was like cool enough with some people where I wasn't standing up at a meeting of, of, of neo-Nazis and going, come on guys, they're not all that way. I mean, I didn't, I didn't feel, I was just, but I felt it inside. You know what I mean? Where I was, and when they would say these things, I just thought, man, that sounds so stupid. And then I started thinking about how I used to say exactly what he's saying back when I first got in. And I thought I sounded brilliant and funny. And I was like, I, did I sound that stupid? Hmm. Wow. So I'm starting to have this little bit of change where I'm like, man, this is, I was like, you know what? On the, I, and I may, I were, I'll never forget this day. I'm taking the train up from uh, South Philly up to Northeast Philly. And I'm on this train and I'm on the train. I actually got to talking to some black dude for about something. And I'm going to go meet up with all my neo-Nazi friends. And we're meeting this black dude. And talk, very brief conversation. But I remember I had a conversation with this black dude about prisons. I mean, he gets off. And he's like, all right, see you later. I said, see you later. And as I'm sitting on a train, I'm about to get off pretty soon. I started thinking to myself, I was like, you know what, man? I'm not going to. I'm not going to preach against black people anymore or Latino people anymore. Like, I, I, I can admit that we're all equal. Like, I got this. Like, I. Like, like we're kind of all screwed here in this country in a way it's set up, you know, that's like, I'm like, if you're poor, whatever, it's not, it's not, it doesn't work good for us. So I'm like, I'm not going to talk about them anymore, but I'm still going to, I have to stay part of this group. I mean, this is my everything. This is where I get clout. This is where I get all my criminal activity. This is where everything comes from for me. My ego is filled here. So I'm just going to talk against Jews. Like I know I have all the literature. I have all the, everything down. I mean, just so you know, and, and you, you, you I'm sure you hear it to this day, it's the craziest thing. When you're talking with someone who's anti-Semitic and then you start proving them wrong with facts and figures and you're like, blah, 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 blah. What's their one out every time they have one out? That's a Jewish conspiracy. And that's it. Argument's over. That's it. We're done. And so I always had that. Well, what happened is I am going and uh, I'm like, I'm just going to keep on preaching against the Jews then and not to stay part of this thing. Well, Hashem has total different plan for me. I just don't know what the plan is yet. No idea. So I'm looking for work, like regular work. I'm trying to get a job. I just got out of prison. I got a big swastika tattooed on my neck and I got skinhead written on my knuckles and an aggravated kidnapping already on my record for life. Permanent felony. These ain't good people skills. <laughs> you know what I mean? The HR departments aren't like, oh, swastika. Management, definitely. No, come on, <laughs> swastika. So, ridiculous. So what happens is, man, a, a buddy of mine comes to me and says, hey, I can, uh, I can get you a job doing antique furniture in the Cherry Hill, New Jersey Mall just for the weekend. He, he just needs weekend workers. Would you be interested in doing that? And uh, I was like, yeah, I don't care. You know, a like hundred bucks a day for three days. I had no other work options. I was like, oh, let's do it. So what he did was as soon as I said, I'll take the job. My buddy goes, you know, the dude, I said, I'll take the job. Yeah. And he goes, well, I got to tell you, the dude that owns the company is a Jew. He still want the job. And I was just like, man, I need to work, man. I don't care. I was like, I don't have to talk to this guy, do I? And he said, nope, you don't got to talk to him. And I said, did you tell him about me? He said, yep, I told him all about you. And I said, well, what, what did this Jewish guy say about me? <laughs> and he said, 
He doesn't give a rat's butt what you believe. Just don't break his furniture. And I showed up and I worked for this man and I worked for him all weekend long and very decent man, very nice man, Phil, huge Philadelphia Flyers fan. I'm a huge Philadelphia Flyers fan. So whenever we had them awkward moments around each other, you know, working, I'd say, hey, how about them draft picks? You know what I mean? Almost like, how about the weather type scenario? Like, how about them draft picks? Yeah, good draft picks. You know, Flyers going to do good this year, a cup this year, a cup this, you know. And we, we still never won the cup, by the way. Flyers haven't won the cup since the day I was born. Uh, so I'm just saying, you know, it's a resentment I like keeping, I think, you know. Anyhow, we get done and uh, he has to pay me my money. And, uh, you know, we all do this, not be anti-Semitic, but we all do this no matter, unless you're so spiritual, you'll float right off the planet. But we all do that thing where sometimes people at work might bother you. So you drive into work and you plan the argument out in your head. You know what I mean? Where you're like, you know what? So-and-so is going to say this and I'm going to say that to him. And I know he's a stupid Dallas Cowboys fan. And you plan out a whole big argument with somebody. You know what I mean? We do it. We all do it. Well, I did it with this man thinking he's not going to pay me my money. He's going to Jew me. He's not going to give me the $300. He's going to say, you know, I know you made $600 in tips, so here's 100 bucks. You're, you, or you should give me money for letting you work here. You know, like I'm running through all the scenarios in my head. Sorry. And uh, sorry, guys. The, the edit that part. There you go. Um, so now this this Jewish man is is coming up to pay me, and I'm, I'm sitting there, and I'm so angry. You know, just like thinking he's not going to pay me. And he comes up to me and he says, I owe you money. And I'm like, yeah, you do. <laughs> How much do I owe you? You know, and I'm like, you owe me, you owe me $300. He's like, oh, yeah, I trade a hundred bucks a day. Here you go. And he pulls out a wad of money, did really well at the antique show. So he had good money. So here's one, two, here's 300. And he's like, you know what? Here's a hundred bucks. You're an extra hundred bucks, man. You're a good worker. So now I got to get thousand dollars from the 400 plus the 600 in tips. And all I thought about in my head was you son of a gun. You ruined it. I had a fight waiting for you. I had an argument waiting for you. I set out landmines so you would step on these arguments to go at it. You know, because that's how I think, man. I want resentments. Again, I'm not right in the head. If you're a neo-Nazi, you're not right in the head. I mean, just so you guys know, also, throughout my whole time of my neo-Nazi, I didn't get to mention this. I'm a full-blown alcoholic. Like, I've been drinking. It's come up where I came up. It's just part of who I was. It's part of my family makeup, whatever. I'm a full-blown alcoholic, and alcoholics like resentments. Well, um, what happens is um, he gives me a ride back to South Philly from, from Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And when he gives me a ride back, he says, hey, what do you do for a living? I told him I don't do anything. I have a swastika on my neck. I don't do anything. And he said, well, why don't you come work for me? And I went and I worked for this man for about six months. And he was just one of the most kindest, nicest men to be in my life. He said good things about me. He, I would say things like, like a lot of kids that are messed up like me. I would mess up or break something. My first thing is, man, I'm so stupid. I'm so stupid. And he one day gripped me up. I broke something. And, he, and he, I said, man, I'm so stupid, Keith. I'm so sorry. And Keith being this little stocky Jewish dude, you know, and you say, Oy vey, what do you, ooh, what do you do? My brother, Jewish? why do you do that? You know, just like that total up East, upper East coast guy. And he come over, man, and he grabbed me by the back of my neck and he said, stop saying you're stupid, you idiot. <laughs> clean it up and let's go. <laughs> and so I clean up my mess the one day and I'm driving in the truck. We're coming from, from upstate New Jersey, you know, down the turnpike, down the Jersey turnpike, then back in the Philly. And man, he's just unloading on me. He's like, I hate when you say you're stupid. He's like, I, I, you're one of the smartest guys I know. Why would you say you're stupid? And we're going back and forth. And he's like, you remember when you figured this out? And you remember when I was telling you and I had this problem and you were like, well, why don't you try this? I'm like, that's brilliant, good, street smart stuff, Frank. He's like, people can't pay for the knowledge you got in your head. Stop saying you're stupid. And as we're driving, he says, and here's the other thing. And, then, and this is the life lesson that that man taught me that I know to this day, which keeps me moving in the, the way that I move, the way that I work. He said, Frank, smart people can fake being dumb, but dumb people can't fake being smart. You're just smart. Wow. Get over it. And I just looked at this man and I'm now I'm shaved bald, 
neo-Nazi boots on, swastika blazing at this guy. And I'm just like, thank you for this man in my life. My God, like, thank you. I should, you know, I didn't, thank you. Like, wow, this is, you know, he was just such a good man to me. And he always said good things or he joked with the right times. He never put me down. And um, so he let me out. He drove me back in Philly, dropped me off. I walked back to my mom's house, man. And as I was walking back to my mom's house, I was just like, I am done. I am done. Like I'm, I'm, I'm beating my head against the wall now to believe this stuff. And what I got tired of, and this is so much of what you see in America right now. This is so much what you see. And it's, it's in every community where you hear people say, I hate all black people. And, and I, you can use a substitute, whatever word you want. I hate all of those people, except for the ones I know from work and the ones that I'm cool with and the ones I went to school with and the ones I talked with and the ones I'm friends with on social media. They're good. They're okay. But all the rest of them, you know, just to give it a a strong, you know, I hate all black people except for Jamal and Craig and Michael. Michael's a great guy, man. He works just like me. He's kids my age, man. We're good people. But all the rest of them, they're all, you know, that way. I hate all that Tino people. They're all this way, except for Juan. Juan's really cool. And John, John's a great guy. Oh, and, and Carlos. I mean, Carlos, me, me, and, you know, me and him, like, we spend time together. His kids are the same age as my kids. They're a great guy. But all the rest of them are this way. It's yeah. so stupid. And that's the way I thought. And here, for one more time, God's putting someone in my life to be like, who are you to judge? Are you out of your mind? Like you're, I'm the worst, dude. I'm kidnapping people. I'm selling stolen guns all around the country, promoting hate. And now I'm gonna judge. I'm judging people now. So, so I'm anyhow, um, curious about your ahead. friend who set you up with this Jewish guy. Like, like is that something that happens? Oh, I have a Jewish guy who I know. Who, you know, you should work for him. Like, it seems like kind of goes against what they believe. It, he. Was he as invested in the Nazi movement as as you were, or was he just like a good question? Yeah, no, no. My friend was, yeah, he was. Here, here's the other thing: Keith had hired other neo Nazis before. There were so many in our area that he had hired other ones before. Like he just did. He was like, I don't care, I don't care what you believe. Just don't break my furniture. Show up on time and be able to come to work. So, uh, Mike, the guy who offered me the job for Keith, mm. um. The one who offered me the job was also a neo-Nazi at one time. So he just, Keith, Keith was, Keith, his name is Keith Brookstein. He's just this amazing guy who's like, whatever, you know, you, you do you in the world. I'm just going to keep doing me. So. And do you think he had an effect on those other people as well, Keith? I think so. I mean, I would hope so. I mean, I know that I know for a fact that they all enjoyed and liked Keith. They would make fun of Keith a little bit because he was a kind of a high strung. Oh, what are you doing? You know, that. The, so they would make fun of that sometimes, you know. But I know that he always treated them with love and respect and always paid them on time. And he never Jewed anybody. He always, you know, in fact, he would, you know, if you needed extra money, he'd give you extra money. You know, he was a good dude. So that's it. You know, it's actually a commandment that you have to pay the wages on time mm-hmm. in the Torah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that now. Yeah, and it's 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 a uh, just to see how that interplay worked is just uh, incredible in a way. Yeah, and Keith wasn't religious at all. Keith was not his his father was very religious, and he came from a religious background and was not religious at all. I mean, he believed in God, but he didn't have any. You know, he didn't have any. He didn't, you know, go to club. He didn't do anything. I mean, he, he just was him. He was just him. But, but it's in the, it's in the DNA to do the right thing. I believe it's in the DNA. As I come to find out later on. Um. So guys, look, I got out. Like I just got out. People say how I just got out. I stopped going around them. I stopped doing what they were doing. I stopped doing all that stuff. So I get out, and then the Oklahoma City bombing happens. I'm so sorry to interrupt. No, go ahead. Was getting out a hard thing to do? Like, was there any threats or like, you know, yeah. is it that simple to just get out? No, no, no. I lost all my friends. I lost every friend I had, every support group, everything I had was gone. And there was people that were like, yeah, we find Frank, we're going to kill him. If we find Frank, we're going to do this to him. And they did. They got, they found me at a, see, I'm not one of these type of people that are like, hey, come get jumped out of the gang. Get out. I ain't 
got kid me, you better catch me. I ain't I ain't walking to go get my butt beat from nobody. You know what I mean? Plus, I'm gonna fight back. But they jumped me at a funeral one time. So yeah, I mean it was yeah, there was and I mean there's still threats on my life to this day, which is crazy. You know what I mean? I I still threats on my life to this day, but whatever. I don't, you know. Destroy the plans of those who seek to do me harm. Spirit do defeat their aims and their purpose. You know what I mean? I don't I don't I don't worry about it at all. Um so guys, that was in nineteen ninety four. I got out. That's how long ago. Nineteen ninety four. And uh, I went to the Oklahoma City. I entered the Oklahoma City bombing, man. I went to the FBI and I said, hey, here's my story. Here's who I am. And I told them, told the FBI everything. Just told them everything. And I didn't put no one in prison. No one went to jail for anything I said. I just told them everything about me. And then they, I went to the, the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, and they had me speak around some schools and with some people. And I felt really good. I felt like I was getting in my karma, like I got a karma score, you know, I, and now again, I don't know anything about my DNA breakdown and, you know, it was just DNA was just kind of coming around with the OJ Simpson trial that we even know of, but learning what your DNA was or something in foreign. But anyhow, I just, I felt like I had a, a really bad karma score and I was going to try and replay that score up. And so by doing good, I was getting a good karma score. And I was, so I just, did a lot of stuff. I started like speaking and helping out and I started doing like interventions on neo-Nazis and I started a hockey program where I got more black kids to play the game of hockey. You know, that's, you know, argue, it's not arguably, it is the greatest game on earth. And I got to teach it to black kids, you know, the, this amazing game. And so I started doing that and um, I went on to go do it in Iowa for a long time. We still drink. Yeah, I'm, still- yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, yep. Great question. I, I'm by the 1986, 1987, uh, 1987, 80, I'm sorry, 1997, 1998, I start trying to get sober. I start, you know, having some, you know, going in and out of the program, um, going in and out of rehabs, um, doing all those type of things. Um, so I'm, around this sobriety thing but i'm not getting it like i i didn't get it yet um really struggled a lot with it and um i moved to iowa trying to stay sober there get a job working in political talk radio then i get a job in professional hockey again start working for all these professional hockey teams i got maybe three or four years sober did good you know build the career then i relapsed again burn it all down in front of everybody, start a new civil rights organization, get two or three years, relapse, burn it all down again in front of everybody. Kept doing it, kept doing it. And um, what happened was, um, and that's perfect lead up, is uh, 19, uh, 2014, uh, now I've had some rough years in my life. I've been from being abused as a stepkid, being maximum security prisons, But I'll tell you, 2014 started the worst five years of my whole life. Um, My oldest son dies in a car accident. Uh, Just a simple, single car, you know, no drugs, no alcohol. Just lost control of his car. Then my mom dies of a fentanyl overdose in 2016. The best man at my wedding, because I've been married now. I got married and my wife was married and had kids and living in Iowa. Well, my best man at my wedding, who was my cousin, who was like my brother, he kills himself. I mean, like we were tight. And then his older brother, who was also like my older brother, he kills himself. Then I had a colleague of one of the civil rights organization I work at, stole a bunch of my intellectual properties and went and sold that he did the work I did. I did the work for 15 years. This guy just started doing the work and then went to a a production company and a TV network and said, oh, I've been the guy doing all these interventions on the interventions on neo-Nazis, which and he sold it. And it looked like he really was the one. It was just and there was other then i got a divorce and then i broke a no contact order you know again now i now i'm back to drinking and using again because i'm in this really dark dark place and by this time i find that i'm jewish i found out i was jewish from a chabad rabbi well he was the first one to really bring it to my attention in des moines iowa in 2014 right around the time that all this stuff's going on um before it started he i was doing a documentary with him about religion in Iowa 
and he was like, Hey, you know, you're Jewish. You should go check it out. And, uh, and because of my last name, which actually my last name is Mink this is my mom's maiden name, but it actually isn't Jewish. It's, but it makes me look deeper. And I put something out on social media right, to some of my family members and my uh, uncle who years ago, when I first was becoming a neo-Nazi, he's one of these really uncles that kind of just, I never really got along with him. He kind of was an uncle that always just busted everyone's chops. He, you know, he just always, from what I always remember as a kid, he was always thought he was better than everyone else or whatever. Just, just giving you the example of why I didn't believe when he came to me when I first became a neo-Nazi, he goes, you know, we have Jewish in us. And I just really thought he was just lying to me just so I wouldn't be a neo not Like, he would just say anything that, you know, just to bust my chop. So I was like, whatever. So I knew he couldn't say I was black. You know what I mean? So he just said, oh, we know we're Jewish. And I was like, whatever, whatever, whatever. So, um, so I find, so I put out on social media after this rabbi comes to me and says, yeah, you know, you're Jewish. My uncle, that same uncle and a couple other aunts all chime in on social media. And they're like, yeah, Frank, like, you know, grandmom's grandmom's mom's mom's mom was 100 percent Jewish and she married this Irishman in like, you know, 1890 or something, something like that. And so they all started chiming in like, yeah, we're all we're all part Jewish. So, OK, I'm going to look into this. And um, to tell you a, a crazy story was also in that time, in about 2004. 13 where right when i was making the first i was making a tv show in 2011 about doing interventions on neo-nazis that was being, going to be aired on amc the network and uh, i was living in la for a brief moment for three months making this television show and i used to i was in recovery and i was struggling in recovery but i was going to recovery i was going to gatherings that we're supposed to go to and while i was at a gathering of recovering people this man came up to me and uh little Jewish guy came up to me at this meeting spot and he came up to me and said, huh, a fellow heave at a meeting. And I looked at him because I knew this one guy that I was talking to and it doesn't matter. This guy comes over to me and says, huh, a fellow heave at a meeting. And I was like, I'm not Jewish. I'm actually a former neo-Nazi. I'm making a television show. I'm all arrogant. I'm like, I'm making a television show right now on doing interventions on neo-Nazis. I'm not a I'm not Jewish. And he's like, well, you look like you heave to me. And he just walked away. And uh, that man I'd stayed in touch with throughout the years, just off and on. Just He lived in L.A. And when I moved back to Iowa after my TV show got canceled, I just randomly would call this man once a year. Hey, what's up? You know, what's up, man? What's going on? You know, whatever. So, guys, I'm telling you that the worst five years of my life is going on. Me and my wife were getting a divorce. Just my life and everything is burning. I was a hockey coach who had won 12 national championships. I lost my hockey coaching career due to my divorce, due to my, my using due to all my own actions. Not so guys, I was in that time. I found out I was Jewish, like I said. So now I'm trying to figure this thing out. And, uh, in the midst of that, I met this one Jewish girl in all of Des Moines, Iowa. There's not many, but I met the one, <laughs> And uh, me and her started dating during my divorce. And while I was dating her, I was leaving her house and I was in the middle of a relapse at the time. And I left her house to go back to the house I was living at. I couldn't go back to my house where my wife and children were because we were in the middle of a divorce and my life was spiraling out of control. So as I was driving, um, this lump came in my throat. Like I couldn't breathe, you know, I, I wanted to scream and I wanted to cry and I just was so lost. So, and I just, and I'm driving and I, and I just was like, <gasps> and I, I just wanted to cry so bad and my eyes were welling up and I couldn't see the road because of my, I was just about to cry again. So I just wanted to cry this thing out of me and I pulled over to the side of the road because there was no way of me driving anymore. And I just sat on the side of the road and I started screaming up at God. I was like, please kill me please put me out of my misery. I can't take this anymore. Like I can't take any of this pain. I, you know, it's all, I, I'm just lost and I'm screaming, please kill me. Cause I don't want to kill myself because my cousins all just killed themselves. And I seen the devastation that it does to people. I know that when you kill someone, when you kill yourself, you don't take that pain with you. You just pass it back down to your children, you know? And I'm like, I don't want to do that. And I was like, please God, let a Mack truck hit me. These are my exact words. Please, God, let a Mack truck hit me or let a telephone pole fall on me. Please just take me out of my misery. I get it why my cousins killed themselves. If this is the pain they felt, 
I get it. And as I'm screaming up at him, please kill me, my phone rings and it's that girl that I've been dating. And I pick up the phone in the midst of me screaming and crying up to God. And I was like, what? What do you want? And she's screaming, crying on her phone. And she's like, get back to my house right now. Get back to my house. And I was like, what? why? Why? And she said, "My sis- I just found out my sister just killed herself. I need you here with me right now. Oh, my God. And I, yeah. And I just hung up the phone. And, and this is my story. I don't, this is my story. This is just like, it's my God, you know. When I hung up the phone, this little voice just came to me inside the car and said, get to California. I have work for you. And I just remember, I can picture this. I think about this moment 20 times a day, sometimes 100 times a day. I think about this moment because it happened. And I just looked at my dashboard where the voice didn't come from the, the voice just came to me. And it was not my own voice. That was the one thing that was the most weirdest thing. It wasn't my own voice. It was something else that said it to me. And I just said, okay, I'll listen. And what that voice said, get to California, man, call that man who called me a heeb because me and him had stayed in touch throughout the years. And he's this magical, I don't want to talk him up too much, but he's a magical man who knows how to wrestle people's egos out of them with love and walk them closer to God. And he's very good at doing it. And he, and he does it. Um, you know, he's, he was born and raised Orthodox. I don't want to tell too much of his story. He was born and raised Orthodox, but now he teaches men how to find God through the program of recovery. And he's, and he, he works with a lot of big people, whatever. Um, and so, like I said, and he, I had talked to him throughout the years where he used to say, Frank, I can help you. He's like, you're insane, but you have some gifts and I can help you. But, you know, you have to be willing to really want to be helped. And what you need for that program to work in your life is you need G-O-D, gift of desperation, that I knew I couldn't live another day with the way I was living and the way I think. And so I called that man and said, hey, I'm after I heard that voice, after I got done helping that girl with her sister's death, I was of service to her. And then we kind of just broke up and went our separate ways in a kind, gentler way. We, I said, hey, I got to go to California. I got to go work with this man because um, I, I can't do this thing. And uh, I've been with that man now. And now when I say with him, I just mean he's my spiritual guide. He's my uh, rabbi in recovery. He's not a, a per se rabbi. He's, you know, was born and raised Orthodox, but he teaches men how to get this thing through recovery. And I still work with that. I talk to him every morning to this day. It's been four and a half years. Um, and in that time, the government and other people have come to me and now my life was in shambles and now the government and everyone's coming to me going, Hey, we heard, you know, about a lot of neo-Nazi cops. And I said, yeah. And they said, well, you come testify in front of the United States Congress for us. And when you testify to the names and, you know, will you tell the truth? And I said, absolutely. And so that happened about three years ago, three and a half, no, almost four years ago. Um, and I went and I testified and um, my life has changed dramatically from, from that moment. And uh, anyway, I, um, very active now i got and when i came here i got not just in recovery i got very active in judaism in my judaism and 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 uh, um you know became part of a temple uh go to torah studies three times a week um you know keep a shabbat in my life uh stay kosher do the hundred blessings a day which is one of my favorite things to do is the hundred blessings a day um you know, pray three times a day um and my activism and what i'm what i believe my my god wants me to do is to he doesn't he's not my servitude says tells me that he's not very happy with mass incarceration he's not very happy with um in the imprisonment of the poor that we do and a lot of it goes back to policing and traffic stops and pulling people out of cars for every little thing and then god's like i'm going to give you the I'm going to give you some of the answers and you're going to go out and you're going to talk about it. And that's what I've been doing for the last four years. Cause you know, when I read Proverbs and that's one of the great things I love about being Jewish now is that I don't go around and try to browbeat people with the Proverbs. I just try to live them to the best of my ability. And I try to educate myself on the situations God wants me to go out and be of service to him for and just do my best. And so that's, that's where I am today doing that work. So I'm curious to know about that um, that voice that you heard in your head or whatever it was. 
do you is that voice something that like you're you kind of use as an inspiration like when you pray do you feel like you want you're kind of trying to get that voice back are you is that is that something that you know obviously really impacted you but did that mm -hmm. change your whole outlook on prayer because you were praying you were shouting and crying out to god and then something mm -hmm. happened miraculously almost and mm -hmm. now as a jew as a practicing jew do you feel like when you pray like there's there's actually something on the other side that's listening i i and i just had a yes yes i when people talk about god if hashem is real any of that i uh, I always go 1 million percent. I know he's real. I know he's real. And it, because of that moment and because not even just because of that exact moment, but because of me listening to the voice of going to the man that was envisioned in my head to go to that man who's going to help you. And the, the way that he has taught me to find and to practice and to uh, believe. And not only that is to rely on, to rely on him. And so, um, so because of that moment it lets me know that it's real yes so you're right it's the, something is on the other side i love prayer and meditation now i mean i look for so every morning just you know you do you i do me that's one thing it says love the lord your god my god i get to do what i want i every morning since i live out here on the west coast now is I get to, I take an hour and a half walk every morning and I call it my my God walk is what I call it. But in that walk, what I do is I'm, I, I get to keep saying the word stay. Stay like because I you know, when you're in an hour and a half long God walk or a walk period, your mind starts to go, Oh, why didn't so and so text me back yesterday? Go, bah, 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 all about myself. Well, the voice that I have inside of me gets to go stay. S T A Y. Stop thinking about yourself. And just think about others. Think about all the people that I, I help in in the program. In the you know I'm very very active in my recovery. Like I help a bunch of other men find their way through recovery. And so that doesn't have to be, you know. So they're not Jewish. Or just in some are some you know one one is now, but all my other guys they're not. But I walk them just as I would walk anyone else to a relationship with God by using the. Uh, the tenants that are in this uh, recovering lifestyle. Again, you have to be anonymous about this stuff. So I can't just go like, hey, I'm part of this one group. You know, that's very, very important that we don't do that. So that's why I have to tread on this tradition very lightly. But most people that know about the program will know this guy's in recovery. So uh, the reason why I just say that is, um, you know, that's a huge part of my, my, also my service is to help other men get out of that life of hell. And it is a life of hell by, uh, by working the, the program so it's a minute. question do you um go by also a hebrew name now not yet not yet i'm going i want to uh, i'm one of the things that i've come to to every every shabbat i usually do a lot with king da i love king david love king david like that's my that's my guy i just yeah. love the, my, the, favorite, my favorite i think he's everyone's favorite character really is yeah um, just yeah yeah he is because he, he's he's the the perfect example of a human being who if you do the right to me what it says to me and again i don't ever preach i don't preach i love that's one of the greatest things too about us we don't get i, I don't got to preach for my room I, I know i have a personal relationship and where i get my strengths from but when i look at where you know when when we do stuff for ourselves it's not so, I don't say God's against it, it's just not blessed as much as when you're doing it for the people, you're doing it for your tribe, or you're doing it for to make others, you know, be able to be healthy and better. That's when it works better. And it, I see that a lot in, in King David's life, you know. Um, and so I try to stick to that. And, you know, and there's one question I ask every rabbi I come across all the time, I always go, why do you think, no matter what, why did he grab five stones when he went to go out? Shoot. Sorry, guys. One of my biggest questions I always ask people is, why did he grab five stones when he should have just grabbed one? He only needed one, you know? And you just love those type of deep thought thinking. For me, it's a very deep thinking thing. Is, um, But the last thing I will say, guys, or not the last thing, but what's very important to me here is, oh, my God. Sorry. Somebody oh. keeps calling in. That's okay. Sorry about that. 
Mm. We don't, we don't yeah. hear it. Um, you can fine. keep going. Don't worry. Okay. Yeah. Um, is that in America, the truth is that in 50 years, we're going to be one, one tribe is molding here. It's in 50 years, like that mixed race American is going to be something that is going to be so prevalent. And then 300 years, almost all of us are going to be the same color. Like that's just the truth. And then we're going to be that tribe for thousands of years, thousands of years from now, we're going to be all one color here. So when we look back on things like mass incarceration, when we look back on things where uh, a certain community keeps saying, yo, we're being abused by this one certain situation. And they're telling us we're being abused. You know, we're going to look back and go, oh, we should have listened, you know. And I know that right now it's really hard for us to say those people or these people are right because some right now, some people are really turning their backs on us. And I get it, man. I get it. But the truth is, if you go back to Martin Luther King, you go back to Malcolm X, you go back to James Baldwin, you go back to all these great American black leaders, they've all talked about police brutality, all of them. And we have mass incarceration on a scale that never has been seen before. And it's mostly off of them. So what are we going to do when this tribe starts to more and more come together? We're going to look back on these times, just like when we look back on cops, sigging dogs and shooting fire hoses and killing them. And we all look back now and go, oh, why didn't we see it? What was what, wrong with us? We're going to do the same thing 20 years from now, 30 years from now. We're going to go, oh, yeah, they used to just pull people over for any reason just so they could rip them out of their car and search their cars. That's insane. And, and we have mass incarceration because we didn't stick to the Bill of Rights. One of the great things about this country isn't the people. Like, we got to be real. People don't come here because Americans are great people. They come, They don't. It's the truth. We have some serious problems and issues. They come here because we have an amazing Bill of Rights. And the Bill of Rights isn't really given to everybody. It's just not. The Fourth Amendment isn't respected on black people or people of color or poor whites. It's not. Cops don't care. They'll rip them out of their cars in front of their children. Search them. And it's something that should not be happening in this country. How, where we're prevalent, supposed to... how prevalent is this? You, you you mentioned that you spoke to the FBI, like, mm -hmm. and you spoke in Washington. What? How how prevalent is this problem? Where they're like they're infiltrating, you know, our different uh, bodies of government and so on, and policing. Like, how how bad do you think it is? It's not that there's like hard carrying neo-nazis anymore it's not that it is that they're a lot of their unions and their membership is very and i i'm not i'm for conservatism i'm for people that are for conservatives i'm talking about far right extremists are a lot in our policing a lot it's it's part of the police bubble just go look at their unions go look at their a lot of what their unions do and say it's it's it really is as bad as people have been saying it is. So it's not just these white supremacists. It's Proud Boys. There's tons of Proud Boys that are police. There's tons of Oath Keepers. These are all far right wing extremist groups and they become cops. And there's a, hundreds of them in like, districts and, and all different places. And so, you know, and, and we're not asking, and I, I, the people that I work with, the activists that I work with, we're not screaming defund. We're not, I'm not for defunding the police at all. Like fund homicide divisions, fund them rape divisions, fund those special units, fund them, but stop funding these little tricks of of you know traffic stops and pulling people out of cars for every little thing. And it's it's not it's not what. If we're, imagine if Ben Franklin, one of my my heroes, one of my biggest heroes in this. If you imagine if he, he would have came back right now and says, "Hey, how's this country?" How's that freedom and liberty we left you? Oh, well, you know, we have 34% of the world's women's prison population. I will say this again. We have 34% of the world's women's prison population in a country that only has 5% of the population of the world. Oh, our freedom and liberty isn't what we thought it was. 
Mm. Like our founding fathers, we horrified that we have mass incarceration on the scale we have. And just for people that are listening to this to think, oh, this is some woke liberalism. This We're not talking about upstate prisons anymore. We're talking about the growth of the American county jails. And that's where they hold. Again, and I'm not a bi- prison abolitionist. I don't, I, I, there's people that do belong in there. But I'm telling you, we're, we're going down the wrong track when they get to do civil forfeitures to people. Like there's a lot, there's a bunch of refor- real, real, real concrete re- police reforms that we can do to stop what's happening to this country. So yeah. and, and that's my job. That's my job today. That's the work that God said, hey, I'm going to give you, give the work. You're, you're, I'm going to give you the knowledge. I'm going to give you the information and you're going to go relay it to people. And that's what I do. Well, God bless you for everything you do. Um, I, I personally, I always like years ago when you hear things about neo Nazis in America, you know, we we don't really experience it because also, you know, it's like right wing extremism is not something that is culturally accepted. For example, an Antifa member, he's going to get a pat on the back, you know, by 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 the culture because it's you know it's there's a lot of liberals in this country and and we 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 promote certain ideas but with right-wing extremism you don't really they, they don't they're kind of underground so mm-hmm. there's this feeling there's always this feeling like okay but it's exaggerated it's not really there and now ever since especially now since after october 7th you're starting to see like the country club anti-semites with their bow mm-hmm. ties coming on on the news you're like oh i thought they were on our side mm-hmm. and 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 it's it's actually like the liberals a lot of them who are behind us and it's not i'm not saying you know, I, I don't have the statistics, but it feels no. like we've been duped, you know, like um, so. So for me, now that you're talking about all this right wing anti-Semitism, you know, do you do you feel like um, we're heading in the right direction with that or you feel like we're just spiraling? No, um, and I, I don't like being alarmist, but, you know, you know, obviously, far right-wing extremism in any shape or form, no matter where it comes from, I'm not for it. But what I've watched, because now for the last 30 years, I've been very active in anti-extremist work. I mean, I've been all over the world. I've worked with different organizations. I've worked with former jihadists. i worked with former Mujahideen. i worked with tons of these people for the last 30 years. That's what I mean. For some reason, Hashem has kept me relevant in that world that when I finally had the spiritual change and I've had the spiritual awakening to truly doing this for other people, I'll tell you this, when I've watched now so many Americans, and it's on both sides, that are blinded to the fact that they are standing behind an Iran-backed jihadist movement who... Like we're losing the marketing game here. And it's 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 crazy that again we're standing behind a group that is backed by Iran, who literally call for the extermination, you know, and the, the genocide of us from the river to the sea. <laughs> and it's and then they call around and say that we're doing genocide. Like we're how how we're losing that marketing war is is crazy. To me, but we are, you know. It debunks, it debunks this whole idea that Jews run the media and all that. Because if we did, we're we're terrible at it, right? Because <laughs> we're like, terrible at run. And let's let's be honest. Before October seventh, even that, we were not good at even running Israel. We were always, argue, you know what I mean? Like we were always arguing and protesting, and you know, like. And, and it just is what it is. It's not, it's not, I'm not judging anybody here. Like we can't even run Israel right, let alone run the world. And I'll tell you that one of the other thing is when I was part of the neo-Nazi world and I still hear to this day from some of the groups where they always go, oh yeah, it's 10 old Jewish men get together and they in a cabal and they can roll the world. I'm like, now that I know the truth because I go to temple and I've been very active in my community, you get 10 old Jewish men together that's 30 different opinions on everything we're about to talk about. What do you, t- you know what I mean? Like we can't even choose where we're going to go to lunch, let alone where we're going to, you know, go run the world. Are you out of your mind? Like that's just real. That's just facts. And they're just beautiful children of God, you know? So what do you think from your unique perspective as somebody who wasn't, you know, practicing Judaism and was anti-Jewish, what, from your point of view, where do you see like the root of anti-Semitism? in this country 
Where does it come from? Is it jealousy? It come, is it ignorance? Yeah. Combination? Yeah, it's good. It's 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 both. Oh, okay, I'm about to. My phone's about to go here, but um, so sorry. Um, it it's a little bit of both. We are, and I'm so proud to say we. Just so you know, I'm so proud to say we. We are a successful minority who has throughout time been the activist for others. And we can go down the whole list of the whole civil rights movement in 1963, 64 was because two Jewish men and a black man were killed in Mississippi. And that's what catapulted the civil rights bill into effect. Um, today or this weekend is, is St. Patrick's Day where we, they eat corned beef and cabbage, which they didn't really eat that. They ate bacon and cabbage when they could, the Irish I'm talking about, until they got close to us in America and the Jew, uh, Jewish uh, butchers and bakery shops. And then we started to supply them with a very, very cheap meal to keep them alive if the Irish were starving to death. And that's corned beef. And now they, it's, it, it's an Irish tradition because we fed it to them. We fed that to them. And I think that's how my ancestors even met, which is a great story in itself. Um, you know, everywhere we go, we stand up for the others when other people hated them. Like people hated the Irish. We stood up with them. Um, people hated the blacks. We stood up with them. So we've always been success and we've always been successful because of the way we're basically trained to be. And what I mean by trained to be is I've come to realize the truth is that it's not that we're just the conspiracy that we're the high ups in a lot of companies and in science and in technology and you name it, you name it, we're high ups in those organizations. It's not a conspiracy. It's just that we have a heritage of learning that we live proverbs. You know what I mean? We just for 3000 years now, we've been studying and learning because we're always on the move and we had to study and learn when other cultures were stuck and stagnated. It's just the truth. And so now we're really good at that. And so wherever we go, we make better, but until the people turn their backs on us. And so, hey, you know, so it's funny. I have, a, I have a Hebrew name for you that you want to maybe consider. Go Natan. ahead. Natan. It means to give. Natan. Hmm. Think about that one. I'll think about it. And actually, think... the connection he's the prophet who tells King David that, you know, the whole story about how he sinned and he admits his, 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 uh, his wrong ways, right? Oh, I didn't yeah. Know. So actually, I think that's a very good name for for him. Think about that. Yeah. Well, that's, we, the, that's the 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 farmer who stole the one who stole the the one. I love that story. I love that story. Amazing story. Well, Frank, I know you said your phone's gonna die, but this was yeah. really like an Truly honor. inspiration. And we we hope to stay in touch. And we really yep. are just so my, we're just blown away by your um your life story and where you are today and. We really wish you all the best and you're, you're an inspiration. You really are. Yeah. We, we feel like you're an angel. So for, oh, thank you. for us, you know, to be just having the honor to speak to you and to spread your message, it's just like, it's an amazing uh, opportunity for us. So thank you so well, much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. Thank you. It's an honor for us. Shavua Tov. Shavua Tov. Bye, guys. Take care.